A, I'm in a position where I can. But I want to be able to look. I know these two young women over here for quite a long time. I've been on a lot of campaigns with them. They're fantastic young women. I want to look, be able to look them and all the other kids that I ever meet. I want to be able to look them in the eye and say, I tried. I did my best. They can't turn around. They're not going to turn around and say, but you knew. Why didn't you do it? Mm. Why didn't you? Why didn't you try and make one change? And and that's where um, a Buddhist-inspired philosophy yeah. comes into play. Yeah. Separate detachment from the outcome. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So detaching ourselves from the outcome and, and doing and taking right actions. That's I I believe an important step, regardless. It's it's not rolling over and dying. No. It's rolling over and living. Yeah. Which totally just destroys my whole death cult thing. Again. <laughs> <laughs> so we need t-shirts. I did my best. No, we need one. Remember, guy McPherson's death cult. That's the t-shirt <laughs> one. I want everybody to leave here. Yeah, yeah. Foundation member. <laughs> is that we've developed a belief over time that before you do anything, you've got to ruminate about it. And you've got to make a decision about it. And you've got to have a picture of it. And you've got to, you, and you've got to uh, make a final choice and decision amongst six or other, six or seven or eight decisions. And it has to have a business plan. It has to be profitable. And has a full yeah. plan which you ruthlessly carry out all the way through to the end. And you notice that, uh, particularly you remember for New Zealanders anyway, um, uh, well, some New Zealanders, but when you, you notice that the sports people that we have, when they actually forget all about that, then their play is wonderful. Yeah. I remember once in 1981, those of you who watched cricket in those days, or 83 or something like that, Martin Crow, who used to, during his test career, used to visualise his following day's batting the night before. God knows how he got to sleep. But anyway, he used to do that and then he'd come out and bat the following day. During the World Cup, he had to come out so often and so quickly and without so much plan that he batted like an angel. Because he was being spontaneous, he was letting the, the act happen in the moment because he saw. And if we actually ruminate all the time, we don't see a damn thing. All we see is our rumination. And so that's, and that, of course, makes us blind. So if we let go, I'm sorry to say this again, but let go of it, then trust, then trust the judgment of the, the organism which is doing the work. Yeah, that's Anthony's um, motocross scenario. But yeah, exactly. I thought about it with yeah. you guys. Be present. Yeah. Be in the moment. Yeah. And I would suggest that you don't actually try to focus. Yeah. Automatically oh, focus. I play guitar as well. Focus so yeah. Yeah. You go up there, you can't, you can yeah. practice all your life, but when you're there, you just got to let go, otherwise it's going to be a battle. I disagree slightly in that um, um, if I want to do mocos, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> I just go. Yeah. Well, you've got to so you've got to practice. Yeah. You've got to practice, practice, practice yeah. first, and then you can go. I saw a TED talk, and I can't remember what the chap's name was, but he said there's two things to get to. He was something to do with soccer, but to get to the level that you want. And he said there's two things that I started. Actually, I have to admit I didn't watch the whole thing, but one is practice, practice, practice. Yeah. And then you can. Then you can let go. Exactly. You know. yeah. But he said the other thing is um, self confidence. You know, and those two together, yeah. it's magic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And self confidence would constitute having having mm -hmm. skill and letting go. Yeah, that you're practicing. Yeah. yeah. And anything. That's saying hello to people. Yeah. And we, yeah. I was really, I'm really grateful to Ivan for bringing Guy out and his partner. Um, they
Radio Four in Tahu Tanga. Um, and I feel really grateful to the people who have hosted us because the time and the uh, experience has been wonderful. So, um, but I, I guess I, I, I do a lot of activism work in New Zealand, just in the spring that I uh, enjoy working with and um, sharing ideas on Facebook with. Um, but I, I do, um, uh, it does drive me to want to um, have, I have, have a belief that we can actually, you know, make a difference. And I do believe that, you know, it may not win or see the outcome that I would like, that we would like to see collectively, but I do believe sincerely that our actions do make a difference. And my hope is that, I know that there's a lot of really good ideas, um, and there is a better way of doing things, um, and um, depending to EPA, um, that's why I'm really trying hard for us to stop that. And um, I wish we could um, have enough of us that could actually just say that you know, our country had enough of a shared vision that we could actually tell those people in Parliament that they don't have the power. And they yeah. can't. We don't they, they, they can't do. They can't deep sea drill. They can't yeah. spy on us. They can't create fear. Yeah. Uh, and they can't. Um, they can't allow um, further atrocities to happen, like bringing over multi. And they can't have an, an unjust system of the monetary system that we have, and they can't bring in GE foods, and they can't deep sea oil and destroy our land and our water. Yeah, but anyway, um, <laughs> I just um, I, I have hope being in forums like this because I know that there is a lot of people out there that share this vision, and um, I, it feels nice to be here and just breathe and be listen to the conversation. So um yes I do have hope and um <laughs> I just can't wait to see um young people like these two beautiful people come and, and be the leaders of um tomorrow because yeah those who can take forward our vision. Uh, and um yeah so yeah, yeah I just I'm I'm still hoping and I'm still gonna live in hope and I'm still gonna do the little bit that I can. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, Thanks for saying that. Yeah, thank John you. Yeah. says one of the most active people in Wellington. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, we need a few too, I am. We're great. We should love each other because we've come here today and we're great spirited people. Yes, I'm looking forward to um, taking that forward, that vision, and I'm just appreciating what you have to say for us. We know that the power is within ourselves, to the answers are here, and that each one of us is a little universe in itself, yeah. and that we are actually um, energy, and we are evil or spirit. And uh, when we pass on, I, I do believe that it's going to take continues. But um, yeah, I don't have a sense of doom um, because I do know that Mother Earth will, will have the ultimate power at the end of the day. But it doesn't mean that we can go ahead and destroy things that we But um, yeah, I'm just hoping that people can join us in our efforts <laughs> to stop the TPPA and, and to affect the oil drilling. And, and, um, yeah, and I'm hoping that um, yeah, we can, we can uh, work with the City Council and just get, yeah, just get good people in. Mm. 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 Thank you, um, Ariana. It really sadly brings us to part of the going to round things up, I suppose, the Pura Puraiki, isn't it, in the Marae sense, which is the, the farewell to some of us do need to leave in about 20 minutes. So it's just, I think, that sort of just speaking and, and just listening just as we perhaps go around as, as a way of closing, if, if you'd like to do that, would be would be good. Yeah. And and just inviting that you to do that. Say something like this, you'll indulge people. <laughs> Is that alright? I just turn oh, you turn, I turned it off, you just turn it off. Right. Um I've just sort of been with the question because I've sort of been part of the preparation for this and the question for me is kind of how I respond to um, all of this knowledge that I've accumulated I mean I, I put this shit out every day uh, <laughs> on my blog I, I can't help myself 
uh, and uh, yeah, that, uh, I certainly don't feel sort of dead inside, but I feel a lot of sadness, you know, for the creatures out there and for people. But there's not a lot of emotionality involved, and uh, really for me, where the emotion comes from, and it does my funny head in, is, is denial of that by people who should know better. And uh, I think that's driven my, uh, driven my obsession. <laughs> and it has really been an obsession. Uh, I'm sure Pam will attest to that. And uh, there are certain, um, tell me if, I'm getting a bit boring. <laughs> um, resonances in my life that I can't uh, make a strong distinction between what's happening out there and what's happening in my own life. Um, because uh, fate has sort of declared that I can't do some of the things that I used to do. I used to go on three day treks into the mountains and the bush and now I can walk around several blocks and I used to teach <coughs> yoga and sit in full lotus and now I can't even really sit on the floor so yeah, um, that, that's the hand that's, um, that fate has dealt me with but what really has got to me is denial because um, I can't really make a distinction between say the scientists or the, you know, those forces that are sort of denying what's happening to us and are out to kill the messenger, messengers. And um, in my own particular case, the, um, uh, the medical system, which can only deal with one particular thing at a time, but essentially at every step they're saying, um, oh, everything's all right, there's, there's nothing wrong. And, and it's that denial again, with, and you know, as it relates to my own life, that really sort of does my healing. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that. It doesn't really get us anywhere, I suppose. But <laughs> yeah. I don't mind. Yeah. You remind me in the same way, nothing wrong, of um, the in um, Sweet Thursday, I think it was, or Canary Road. Um, one of the characters there was asked by the doctor, um, "Is your father alive?" He said, "No, nah, no." Nah. He said, oh, he's dead. Yeah, what did he die of? And the fellow says, oh, nothing much. <laughs> well, I live with Robin, and Robin certainly exists. Very much so. Very much so. I live with Robin, and Robin certainly exists. And there's no denial of it. <laughs> the aspect of you I don't believe and I guess I live with climate change and it would be a bit easy to deny that <laughs> yes. but I don't no. because I use my intelligence my senses my communication with others and I see it and I, I um, it's really it's just acknowledging your your willingness to kind of open, open this up and step outside the, the sort of formal scientific world, and I'm sure that's cost you dearly to actually dare to, to do this. And I don't, I just really want to acknowledge that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's your power. Mm -hmm. Really fantastic. And, and, um, it's not done. It's all done now. You can put that up in the shelf. Next subject. I'd be the world's worst presenter. I'd be the medical doctor who comes in and tells you you have six weeks to live and be sure to pay your pay your bill on the way out. I gotta go to golf. So I used to just present the information, right? Say. Three and a half C above baseline. Looks like there won't be a habitat for humans. Looks like we're headed there by this date. And catch you later. And and it was that was horrible. 
I mean, people would just be going, what, what happened? What, what happened there? I thought you were good. <laughs> this is a recent phenomenon. <laughs> it's only recently that I have um, inserted, that I've developed my, my death cult. I mean, that I've put some heart into my presentations. I used to be the uber rational scientist, right? I would just give up and present the facts so, just the so facts came, and then I'd just walk away. What happened? A it's couple a of things. Change. Um, yeah. One of the big things was just in January of this year, not very long ago, I went to a grief recovery workshop and became certified. Not certifiable, <laughs> certified <laughs> as a grief recovery counselor. And then a couple of weeks later, I went to Winnipeg in February. The whole time I was there, I was there for six days. It was colder in Winnipeg than it was on Mars. And I participated in a, in a series of meditations on death and dying conducted by the world's leading authority on those meditations. And I was invited by the Lama. Who, who was that? Uh, a guy named John Desjardins, who lives in Vancouver, Canada. And the, the Lama who invited me had founded the Dharma Center. And he saw a, an interview, a four minute clip of something that I put out in October. He'd been following my work for many years. And I was the uber rational scientist, and he thought I was an idiot. And I don't know if he ever changed his mind about that. <laughs> and, and he recognized that I was frustrated and angry and speaking inappropriately and so on. And then he saw this four minute clip in October of last year, about a year ago. And he says, He's done it. He completed the Asuba meditations. And so he sent me an email message and said, Can we talk sometime on the phone? I said, Yeah, sure. And he said, You've completed the Asuba meditations. And I'm should I tell him? The hell is that? <laughs> That's awesome for me. I'm great I did that. What's an Asuba meditation? And it's, the Asuba meditations are meditations on the disgusting, on the repulsive. And almost nobody does them anymore in Buddhist practice. But his teacher had required all of his students, including, including Lama Jerry, to watch a human body decompose over many months to visit the body every day. That's about as disgusting as it can get. And he said, you've been watching the body for a long time. And you turned out to be a compassionate human being. Good for you. Way to go on the whole Asuba thing. And so I watched the body for a long time. <coughs> Apparently that's useful. And, and I, yeah, you, you can only meditate on the disgusting, on the repulsive for so long before, if you're thoughtful about it, before you come out the other side and you're no longer the uber-rational scientist who goes around telling people, good for you, you get to die, catch you next week. <laughs> How the awakening, isn't it? Yeah. It and then, people's at different stages. And this is very late in my life. And, and so since, <clears throat> since that has happened, and in the process of it happening, a whole bunch of the people I meet tell me that I have, I have accomplished through reading philosophy and thinking deeply and writing about these issues, what they get with one dose of cyclobenes, of shrooms, mm -hmm. of mind-altering drugs. And so they say, I'm sorry it took you 40 years. There's a much easier route. <laughs> right. And so a lot of people come up now and offer me that experience. Um, and I say, I'm already there. <laughs> so, so no need. So do they get to keep that enlightenment after they come down off the hill? They do. Absolutely. Yes. I do. My thoughts. <laughs> it's life changing. Once you see reality fade away, this version of reality fade away. It's life changing. You can't go back. Once you see it, once you see it, you cannot see it. It's the same kind of thing. And there's a there's a variety of, of chemically induced ways to get there. Okay. Or Deep thinking. Earlier you told us that enlightenment was a curse. This is another thing that people can't unsee. Is this thing a curse or a blessing? Yeah, yeah. It's all of the above. It's whatever side you focus on. It's horrible and disgusting and awful and amazing and beautiful and enlightening. As in not heavy, but light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I was given a death sentence by a surgeon when I was in my early 50s, following the removal of all the lymphatic glands under my arm. And I remember sitting up on the bed the morning after when this young surgeon came around. He hadn't done the operation, but he had to do the rounds. He had a whole bunch of young doctors and footballs and things. He was terribly serious. He had to read out to me the fact that I had a of a, a very small likelihood in the terms of percentages of living beyond five years. And I, I remember sitting up and I had I don't think I'd been meditating, but I was sort of cross legged and I, I looked at him up in the room and I said, if we're all going to die, you know, doctor. <laughs> 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 I just sort of, it just opened him up and, and it, it just came up. I said, well, because I've, I've studied meditation with Gaon and with Buddhist teachers for a very long time and I've practiced them since. And it, I just, it just came up spontaneously. I knew in that moment it was absolutely true. And he couldn't. His mask just cracked, you know. He just had to kind of... And then I pulled the curtains and I had a good cry. And I did. But it was a moment that I kind of, you know, remember. It's actually, when you think about it, it's enormously relevant to the problem that we face because the problem is ultimately being caused by an obsession throughout our culture with possession domination, hierarchy, and with living as long as possible with as much as possible, and yes. competing with the other. And we're yeah. a culture that was a he famous expression of toys. <laughs> and if we didn't have that, but if that, I mean, the, the, the alternatives are almost unimaginable for us because they're outside our cultural reference, but it just didn't have to be this way. You know? I, I think Edward Abbey, the iconoclastic Tucson-based writer, was 54 when he went to the doctor.